Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. So um, thank you all very much for joining us today. Um, it is a great pleasure to have um, a friend and a colleague, uh, Dr. Talithia Williams, who is going to join us. Um, before I do give the introduction, I wanted to let you all know that we will be doing uh, questions and answers during the presentation. So please feel free to either chat in the chat window with various questions and comments you have, or please put them in the Q&A window that's the primary place we're going to be getting our questions from. Um, Dr. Talithi Williams is an associate professor of mathematics at Harvey Mudd College. That, that's not right. Are you now full professor? Is that right? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> soon. Soon, very soon. Okay. All right. Well, as far, as far as I'm concerned, you you are a full <laughs> professor of mathematics. I'm I'm thinking positive thoughts in the universe. <laughs> um, she is renowned for her popular TED Talk, "Own Your Body's Data." Dr. Williams um, gives takes sophisticated numerical concepts in this talk and makes them understandable to a wide audience. She became the first African-American to ever receive tenure at Harvey Mudd College. And I wanna say that due to her efforts, now there are three African-American professors in the mathematics department there at Harvey Mudd. In 2015, she won the Mathematical Association of America's Henry Alder Award for distinguished teaching by a beginning college or university mathematics faculty member. This honors faculty members whose teaching is effective and extraordinary and extends its influence beyond the classroom. In 2018, she published Power in Numbers, The Rebel Women of Mathematics, a full color volume that takes aim at the forgotten influence of women on the development of mathematics. She has partnered with the World Health Organization, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, NASA's Johnson Space Center, and the National Security Agency. Mm -hmm. Dr. Williams is co-host of the PBS series, Nova Wonders, and she has delivered speeches around the country on the value, on the value of statistics and quantifying personal health information. So Dr. Williams, it is a great pleasure to have you here and we are certainly looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much. I'm gonna go ahead and share the presentation with you. Right. Awesome. Great, everybody sees that okay? Thumbs up. Okay, um, I'm super excited uh, to have a chance to uh, chat with you uh, about not so hidden figures and how we might unveil uh, mathematical talent. So since everybody's in the chat, hopefully you can see, um, why don't you tell me who this person is? Who is this beautiful woman? Hopefully if you type in you put Rosa Parks. Um, a lot of us know Rosa Parks for her activism, um, her role in the civil rights movement, for refusing to, to give up her seat on a bus in Alabama. We celebrate her. There's a statue in her honor. There's stamps in her honor, uh, books that celebrate uh, the life and the cause that she fought for. Um, how many of you can tell me who this young lady is? What's her name? Any thoughts in the chat for who this woman is? I didn't actually learn about her until later in life, um, but her name is Claudette Colvin. Claudette Colvin also, like Rosa Parks, refused to give up her seat uh, on a segregated bus in Montgomery. It was nine months before Rosa Parks did, though. And, and so one question that I asked myself when I found out about Claudette was, well, why did I never learn about her? Why was her story hidden from me? Even though she had a profound effect on the civil rights movement, she was one of the plaintiffs who was in the case that eventually went before the Supreme Court to overturn segregated buses in Alabama. Um, and so in some ways, Claudette Colvin was, was a hidden figure uh, prior to Rosa Parks. We don't know much about her life, uh, but yet her work uh, was sort of the underpinning of what Rosa Parks was able to do. Um, now, how many of you saw the movie Hidden Figures? I'll just, I'm sure many of you are raising your hands out there. Um, but here's a clip from the movie Hidden Figures that I uh, absolutely, this is my favorite, favorite clip from, from the scene. Uh, it's a little bit choppy, so hopefully you've seen the scene before, but we're going to watch it together. So we're at the vehicle speed, the launch window, and for argument's sake, the landing zone is the Bahamas. Should we be able to get the go no go? In theory, sir. We need to be past theory. So that's the landing zone. Five, six, six, seven degrees north, seven, seven point three, 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 three degrees west. Which is the twenty square miles. I like your numbers. This is probably 
um, it's my favorite scene from the movie because it kind of shows uh, Catherine Johnson really uh, taking ownership of that space, right? And, and using her mathematical ability um, to really help shape the space race. And so this movie highlights other women as well and the work that they did. Um, and their stories were so compelling. I remember watching it and like crying in the movie theater because I had no idea that these amazing black women, mathematicians uh, had come before me. And I thought, you know, what, how meaningful would it have been for me to know that they existed and, and to, to learn about their lives uh, prior to the movie coming out. So when I think about a hidden figure, I think about a person who uh, makes an impact without necessarily making their presence known, right? So they've made an impact maybe on the field of mathematics, but have, their presence isn't necessarily known in the field. Uh, and maybe it's concealed by circumstance, not necessarily uh, by their choice. And so when I reflect on mathematicians who have made an impact for me, uh, many of them were, are hidden figures. Uh, many of them are not household names like Katherine Johnson. Um, they're lesser known uh, women. And so I wanna highlight a very particular woman uh, today who's made an impact um, on my life. Uh, this is a picture of me as a, oh gosh, maybe I was in junior high school, maybe seventh, eighth, and ninth grade. Um, but as a child growing up who was excited about math, but could never really see herself in mathematics, I didn't know who these women were. And I wasn't able to be shaped by them as, as a young girl. So it wasn't until I'd already gotten into the field that I realized that there were so many amazing uh, women of color who did mathematics. So they, they were hidden from me. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about sort of how I got to where I am today and some of the women who shaped me, some of the hidden mathematical women that, that shaped me. Uh, here I am, this is my drill team from middle school. Um, yeah, I forgot this is gonna be live stream. Like this is not the picture that you want on the internet, but here we are nonetheless. Uh, so you see me there, second row on the very end. Um, as a, as a junior high school eighth grader, I was not just super excited about math. Like I, I did well in it, but I love being on the drill team. I love dancing. I love doing things that, that young girls enjoy doing. Um, when I got to high school, I got a job as a cashier at a local grocery store. So as a sophomore, the summer after my sophomore year, I started working and this is sort of back in the 90s. So, you know, we had um, we had cash registers that were more like typewriters. They were big, they were clunky. And I remember at work, I would always try to calculate the change that I owed someone. So if you paid with a $20 bill, I'd try to figure out how much I owed you before I could punch it into the, the type register. Uh, what I didn't know at the time was doing that was actually building my mental math skills, like my basic math. And um, and so, you know, my part-time job as a cashier actually kind of helped uh, math develop for me. Uh, the only person, the only African-American that I really knew that did math was Dwayne Wayne on A Different World. And, you know, maybe it's fictitious, but I loved him anyway. Um, and so, you know, for me, math wasn't necessarily something that I was going to jump at uh, and do. It was just sort of, you know, one of the topics in school that I kind of had to get through. Um, I ended up going to Spelman College, a uh, historically Black college for women in Atlanta, Georgia. And it was at Spelman that I first met African-American female mathematicians. Um, in the summer of 1996, I did their summer science program. And this was a program uh, sponsored uh, by NASA where we came and we got to do classes. And it was the first time that I met uh, the person who would become one of my mentors, uh, Dr. Etta Faulkner. And so um, this summer program, we're doing math, we're taking classes and, you know, here comes this sweet little old lady and, you know, who's a mathematician. And I'm like, who is this woman who was almost grandmotherly, you know, I mean, it was just so with like a super soft, sweet, kind voice, but was very firm when it came to um, how serious she was about math and how serious she wanted us to take our mathematics. Um, so a little bit about Dr. Faulkner, 
Uh, she was born in 1933 in Tupelo, uh, Mississippi, recently died in, in 2002. Um, she worked at Fisk University as the chair of their math department uh, for a number of years. Uh, Evelyn Boyd Granville um, was one of her mentors, one of the first women to, to get a PhD in mathematics, one of the first black women. And um, she was encouraged to go on to grad school uh, by her mentors and actually got inducted into Phi Beta Kappa. It's interesting when you hear about her journey uh, in, in grad school, she started at University of Wisconsin, which uh, had no female professors, no African-American professors and graduate students who would not work with her. And that environment led to her leaving and she ended up finishing her PhD in her 30s uh, at Emory University. And um, once she got to Spelman, I think she saw the dearth of Black women who were going into mathematics and really um, focused her legacy on encouraging Black women to pursue mathematics. And so she founded the NASA Wise Scholars Program, the undergraduate research programs at Spelman, to really guide these high achieving students uh, toward mathematics. And so this is the point where I was entering her life, right? Through these programs that she had founded. Um, never did I think I was gonna graduate with a math degree. I mean, I sort of came in like interested in science, but Dr. Faulkner was the one who really helped shift me over toward mathematics and encouraged me even to, to continue. Uh, it's funny when I think about her last name, what does it mean to be a Faulkner? Uh, the definition is actually a person who keeps uh, trains or, and hunts with falcons or other birds of prey. And um, when I think about the word Faulkner and what it means, it really makes me think about her legacy and how she likewise was training us, training women to really soar and to really be excellent in, in mathematics. And so that was one thing that I really take away from my time with her, uh, that I was fortunate to have those four years at Spelman uh, to be mentored by her. So for the rest of the talk, uh, I wanna shift from not just who Dr. Faulkner was as a person, but sort of what she was able to share with me. And I, I kind of dubbed that the Faulkner mindset, the strategies that she shared with me that encouraged me uh, to, to persevere in graduate school, but also to think about the pipeline and how I might help mentor um, folks that are coming behind me uh, and help build up that mathematical talent in the same way that she did. Okay, so um, Faulkner mindset number one, she was always about how do we build an inclusive community, right? How do we take these women who were interested and talented in math and help them see themselves as a community. Um, she founded the, the WISE Scholars Program, Women in Science and Engineering. And the, the things that we, that this program was really known for was uh, mentorship between faculty, between students and between NASA scientists. So every summer, we would spend a summer at NASA working directly with the scientists. Uh, we partner with faculty in the math department, do research projects, and then as a cohort, uh, we matriculated through Spelman together. So we had that relationship. Um, it also created a network of black women mathematicians. So even after graduation, uh, we had this network of wise scholars and mentors who we were able to um, stay in touch with and who we could use for motivation. And um, the four years at Spelman were really marked by a non-competitiveness, which when you think about it, it makes the process of learning uh, mathematics even more enjoyable, right? So that I could go to my fellow wise scholars, my math majors, I could be open with questions, with confusion in an environment that was always supportive, it was always affirming. You know, she really helped to create that environment that once I got to grad school, I realized what an amazing space that was once I got to a space that maybe wasn't quite as affirming and it was kind of like, nah, maybe you won't be in our group. Um, and so that was really strategic of her to, to create that undergraduate space. And then she instilled in us an expectation to go to graduate school. It was just like, 
this is what you should do. This is, you're talented, you can do it. You're bright, you should, you should absolutely go to grad school. Um, and I don't think I had that mindset when I arrived at Spelman. I'm like, I'm gonna get an undergraduate degree and get a job and live my life. And so she was the one who really helped to shift my thought process into even thinking about uh, math for graduate school. The three summers I spent at NASA, I got to work with these amazing folks, uh, Claudia Alexander and Lonnie Lane. I was in Lonnie's lab and um, I remember the first day and I'm like, hello, Dr. Lane. And you know, he's like, call me Lonnie. And I was just like, no, sir, I'm from Georgia. We don't call anybody by their first name. Um, and so just, it, you know, it was just a completely different uh, environment to be at NASA where everyone's on a first name basis. And it was so much, you know, team-based work and to be included as, as, as a member of the team. Uh, Claudia, who also worked there, was my mentor. And, uh, you know, it's so powerful to, to visually have an image of a person who looks like you, who is doing something that you could see yourself doing. And, you know, seeing Claudia being mentored by her, uh, let me see that this was a possibility for me, like, oh, Maybe I could one day, you know, work at NASA and um, do this thing that Claudia does. So having that image of her, um, you know, gave me something tangible to really hold on to. I remember my freshman year, uh, Etta's math advice, because, you know, Morehouse College is right across the street from Spelman. It's a historically Black college for men. And so, you know, sometimes we can get distracted by what's across the street. Uh, but here's what she said, Clithia, you can be blind in one eye and can't see out the other, but you can always get a man. <laughs> what you need to do now is focus on your school and trust me, these men will still be there. And so I appreciate how she always kept it real. Like she knew but here we are, you know, with this amazing institution, our brother school across the street, and that our focus would sometimes waver. And I thought she did such a great job of saying, listen, I want you to stay focused on your math. You know, I know y'all are happy to see these guys across the street, but you can always, you know, find a guy. You know, this is the time for you to really be serious about the work that you're doing. Okay, Faulkner mindset number two, find graduate schools that will admit matriculate and graduate you. And as a student, this never crossed my mind, right? I told you I wasn't thinking about grad school. Dr. Faulkner planted that seed, but she didn't just say like, go forth, find a place, apply, just, you know. She was really strategic in um, sending us places where she knew we were gonna be successful and where she had contacts or, you know, folks in the department that she knew that we're gonna take care of us. And so I remember I wanted to go work with Carlos Castillo Chavez, who was at Cornell at the time. And he was doing work in math bio and you know, very supportive of underrepresented students. And so I told Dr. Faulkner, oh, I wanna to apply to this program. Here's where I wanna go. And she said, you're not gonna be able to find a husband in Ithaca, New York. Notice the difference between freshman year and senior year, right? Freshman year, she's like, ignore them. Senior year, she's like, you got to think about where you're going to go to grad school because now like you want to start thinking about husband material. And then she said, who's going to do your hair in Ithaca? And I thought, oh my gosh, you know, Etta, you make a good point. And so it wasn't just about like find the most amazing program. It's find the program that's going to fit with the goals that you have for yourself in life, right? And she knew I wanted to get married. She knew I couldn't have my hair looking a mess in grad school. And the fact that she reiterated that to me and she said, listen, Cornell's a great place. Carlos is amazing. But let's think about what your life looks like in Ithaca for five or six years, right? Um, she also uh, encouraged me to apply to the EDGE program, Enhancing Diversity in Graduate Education. Woo, woo. Edge. Um, I did the EDGE program in the summer of 2000. There is my cohort there in the slightly blurry uh, picture. We were at Bryn Mawr that summer. Uh, Amy Radinskaya is there and Rhonda Hughes and oh, Helen, yay! Um, and so it's, 
it, it's it's so amazing to me the way that Dr. Faulkner was able to sort of do a warm transfer, right? From Spellman over into the EDGE program uh, that was one run by Rhonda and Sylvia Bozeman and how they really shepherded us. This program shepherded me through graduate school and shepherded uh, women through graduate programs. Uh, many of, of you who are edgers um, can attest to. Uh, I was a mentor for the program in the summer of 2003. And so the other picture you see there is me as a mentor at Pomona College. Yay, Pomona. Ooh, ooh. Um, so the EDGE program was really great too, because you know the way that Dr. Faulkner sort of shifted us through in this program then uh, guided us through graduate school um, and giving us sort of that cohort mentality uh, to be with. Um, I started at Howard University in their PhD program in math and took a stats course, fell in love with statistics and ended up transferring to Rice University where um, I finished my PhD in statistics and there is my amazing advisor, Kathy Enzer, who is, is still there now. And um, finished my PhD with a two week baby in tow. That two week old is now 12 years old. Uh, wow, that was so long ago. Notice these are all pictures from graduation. These are all the happy days. Another talk, we'll talk about leading up to that, but uh, for now you get all the happy pictures. Lastly, um, the Faulkner mindset number three uh, for me that she taught me was really to pursue my passion. And um, I remember as I got closer to graduation um, from grad school, from Rice with a PhD, by that time, Dr. Faulkner had passed away and you know, in talking with some of my mentors at the time, their advice was, you know, get a tenure track job, get tenure, and then do the stuff that you're passionate about. And, you know, as I'm doing the math, I'm like, well, that's really pushing me out a long time before I can really focus on what excites me, um, you know, in addition to the mathematical work that I do, because I really wanted to Think about how we might increase the pipeline of women of color, of black women in mathematics. And I kept looking around at these stages as I moved higher and higher in higher ed and I saw less and less women who looked like me. And so that was the, at the, the top of my passion uh, at graduation. Um, the way that I fulfilled that was, was working with the EDGE program. I got to um, direct the EDGE program in the summer of 2012, I think is maybe when this cohort, oh yeah, because I've got little Micaiah there. Yeah, that's right, he was born in 2012. Um, and so being able to really take that passion and immediately use it to um, work with the EDGE program to, to mentor young women who are coming just behind me and, and, and keep them excited about math the same way that Dr. Faulkner um, excited me about math. Uh, I've had a chance to serve on the EDGE Foundation board. And so thinking about, you know, how do we continue and build these programs uh, that support women and support people of color, Black folks in mathematics. And the EDGE Foundation is, is one very tangible way that we go about uh, working to do that. I love this quote by Dr. Faulkner. She says, perhaps the most rewarding moments have come when younger faculty have undertaken the same goal and have surpassed my efforts, reaching out to the broader community to help minorities and women uh, achieve in mathematics. So I wanna leave you with some ways that I think I've tried to take those words and put them to work in my own life. How might I think about like reaching further out um, and touching the lives of, of other women and, and people of color in mathematics. Um, when I got to Harvey Mudd on the faculty, there were very few students of color, uh, black students and black women in particular. And, you know, being in Southern California, it's a very diverse part of the country. And, and so I thought, well, what can I do in this moment to change the makeup of not just students at Harvey Mudd, but students who might come to the Claremont colleges or just in, you know, encourage um, black girls to think about STEM and math and engineering. And, and so um, 10 years ago, I partnered with 
a local nonprofit and we started a STEM conference for underrepresented girls and invited them to Harvey Mudd's campus, them and their parents uh, for an all day Saturday event. And so this is really one way that I wanted to reach out to the local community. I partnered with uh, churches, uh, guidance counselors, um, worked with our community engagement office, even invited leadership from the college to attend these events because it wasn't just like, yeah, let's bring these girls here, but let's think about how we might partner with the community to really transform the landscape of higher ed, especially when it comes to women in STEM and getting them excited about STEM. This is a picture of uh, the guidance counselors who are at Claremont High and Nikki Mitchell, the black woman on the back row. Um, she, would, she came to the first session and did uh, a session for our parents. And so every year she's come and done workshops for the parents of our girls to give them resources because many of them come from schools that don't have as much funding or resources as Claremont High does. And so she gives them all of that um, so that they can then use that for their daughters and, and for their sons as well. One of the joys of the Sacred Sisters Conference is getting current students to volunteer and working with uh, my students to help them really think about how they might impact women and people of color in mathematics, how they might really get excited about that work and about taking that on in whatever they decide to do too. And so it's been really an unexpected joy for me to see how my students are impacted when they volunteer and see all these girls who are so excited about math, who are so excited about STEM. Um, and to see that many of them come from school districts that lack resources, that lack counselors. And so it has nothing to do with their ability. It really has to do with um, you know, their zip codes and, and the resources that their high schools have. And so helping my students be sensitive to ways that they can impact that change in their careers as well. The structure of the conference stems from um, a lot of the mentorship that I got from Dr. Faulkner. Uh, giving the girls a chance to uh, use their voice in that space, to meet women, women of color uh, at small round tables or presentations, to see how women are using math and statistics and data science and engineering in their everyday life. Um, you know, I shared with you, it wasn't until I got to Spelman that I met a mathematician. And I thought, well, one component of this conference, I want these girls to see people who look like them who are already doing STEM, right, in some way, so that they don't have to wait until they're a freshman in college to be inspired to see themselves as scientists. And so uh, a large component of the conference is showcasing women of color who are scientists and engineers and computer scientists who are using math um, and science as an example for these young girls. Um, the first year, parents came and they they were just like, I'm not leaving my baby here. Like we didn't have anything for parents to do. We were just like, it's a conference for girls. Thank you, come back later. We don't even have food for you. Like don't, don't stay. Parents hung around. And, um, and so that's when we were like, well, maybe we should do a parent workshop. Like we should do something while they're all hanging out here. Um, and so we did, we put together a workshop. So the parents have a separate program uh, where they get those resources from Nikki and, and uh, get other tools and, and even share their personal experiences, right? Share what programs have been effective for their, their kids and what programs haven't. Um, I love this quote. Uh, every year we do a survey, and this is a quote that one of the parents said, I most enjoyed seeing the excitement and wonder in each young woman as they sat at the footstools of women who were practicing and actualizing uh, their dreams. So that really spoke to me. The conference has been highlighted by Forbes magazine um, in terms of ways to increase educational opportunities for minorities in STEM. So that was really exciting. Um, we got written up in the local news, Inland Valley News and the Daily Bulletin. And so that was fun to sort of see how this, uh, this one idea um, had really put our campus in the spotlight as, a, as you know, us being a resource and being a place that attracts girls of color uh, into STEM fields. And so that was really, I was really proud uh, to see our school represented that way. And then uh, lastly, when I think about how I might personally make an impact, 
uh, it really has to do with how I might continue Dr. Faulkner's legacy. I think she mentored so many women at Spelman and beyond, and those women, myself included, have gone out to make an impact uh, because of, of her work. Uh, so a little bit of my uh, advice that I'll share with you um, in terms of making an impact and, and, and uh, living out your passion is one to bring your whole self to work. And, and you know, this is something, these are three of my colleagues, so uh, Dagan and Art um, and Daryl uh, with our youngest son, Micaiah. So this is, oh gosh, eight years ago. Um, you know, it's, it's sometimes you almost sometimes want to separate the two, right? Like, you know, how do you let people see inside and, you know, see the inner workings of your life? And I thought, well, if, you know, if I'm going to be successful, I need people to embrace everything that I bring to the table. And so uh, those were three times where this kid was at school with me and I'm like walking around, like, can you hold this baby? I got a teacher, can you do this? And so really kind of inviting people to not just a partner with us in raising our kids, but you know that this is a part of me that I'm bringing to the table that I want to share with the department. Um, Micaiah is one of three, and you know it's important I think for all of us, but especially for women and people of color, to feel like you can bring that part of you to this space uh, because when you when you don't see a lot of people who've come before you who've done that, you know. Um, many senior colleagues at my institution had, you know, wives who were stay at home. And, and so, you know, if you don't see that around you, sometimes you wonder, well, is this okay for me to bring, to bring all of myself to this job, to this position? And so I wanna encourage you that you should. And, um, and, and that's what I've tried to do. And I think it's made um, my work-life balance all, all that much better. And then giving back to the, the community, as we mentioned the TED Talk and, and the book, um, power in numbers, you know, one of my reasons for authoring that book was that I didn't see these women growing up. I didn't know their stories. I didn't know about NASA's hidden figures. You know, I, I didn't know about all the amazing women who'd come before. Um, and I wanted to sort of leave behind breadcrumbs. Like, you know, there's got to be some way that girls aren't in college before they learn about who these amazing women are. And so, in authoring that book, I wanted to highlight in a beautiful way uh, some of their stories. Eugenia Chang is, is one of the women that gets highlighted. She's a popular mathematician. Here she is uh, on Colbert at the bottom. And so uh, her work is highlighted. Um, I just wanted to show you just a couple of pictures from the book because it's very visual uh, as Edward mentioned and really wanting to kind of invite people to the table invite them to share and now the late Katherine Johnson's life and all of the work that she did uh, working with my editor to go and like find some of these old pictures and you know when you think about the amazing impact that she had on the space race her calculations and yet you look in the control room and you see all white men you know and so just just to think about you know as we grew up learning like I never knew that her impact was behind the scenes and, and the work that was being done. And so um, I really wanted to kind of highlight how often that work was hidden. And so it's beautiful to be able to see her later in life get the recognition um, that, that she so rightfully deserved. And then for me personally, I think the way that I've really wanted to think about um, impacting the, the next generation is uh, public engagement, how to get young girls uh, and families and parents just excited about math, about the possibilities that are available in statistics and data science and in the value and the joy that can come from pursuing these fields. You know, um, often I'm sure as you interact with folks and they say like, oh, this is hard, math is so hard. I can't believe you're a math professor. Um, you know, I wanna share the other side of that is that there's joy and there's beauty and there's a lot to get excited about and so, been excited to share that message in different spaces. Um, got to recently partner with PBS and host the show Noble Wonders. This was, y'all, this was so amazing because it was completely unexpected. I think when they first reached out, my thought was, you know, you're joking. Like there's no way uh, that you're serious about me hosting a show, right? And so to see it all come together, to see this six part series come together, 
to see how they have been really intentional in showcasing diversity among the, um, the hosts of the show, among the scientists who they featured, and how their goal, like Dr. Faulkner's, was how can we change the face of science? How can we let everyone see that everyone is a part of this field? Um, and so that, that made me really excited to, to partner with them and to build on that legacy. I'm gonna show you a clip from the movie. Inside the human brain, there's about 100 billion neurons. Dr. Faulkner's legacy uh, lives on in the women that she touched. And, you know, our lives, my life in particular, has been dramatically shaped by not just her mentorship, but her encouragement, her friendship, um, her counsel when things got difficult, uh, you know, encouraging me to, to persevere. I love this quote uh, that she says, and I'm going to end. Uh, on, on her words, she says, I've devoted my entire life to increasing the number of highly qualified African-Americans in mathematics and mathematics related careers, high expectations, the building of self-confidence and the creation of a nurturing environment have been essential components for the success of these students. They have fully justified my beliefs. Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. So I really, really do appreciate it. Um, I, I do want to give people some more time to maybe put some questions, comments here in the chat window. We're going to try best to go through them. But I wanted to start off with a few questions for, for some things that, that you've said here. Um, I, I want to go back to uh, the, the Sacred Sisters um, the conference mm -hmm. that, that you had, and in particular about the parents' workshop. Um, I've been asking my summer students, since there are schools all around the country, why are there perhaps not a lot of Black students majoring in mathematics? And they start to tell me that perhaps for a lot of students in their households growing up, math wasn't really that big of a deal, that their parents encouraged them to maybe go into one of the professional fields, like, you know, be a dentist, be a doctor, be a lawyer, be an engineer. I was thinking with the parent workshop that you had, here you're trying to convince parents to maybe convince their girls to go into STEM. Did you <laughs> push back with this idea of why should they waste their time going into mathematics? Or maybe even what were some things that you tried to encourage them specifically about STEM? Yeah, you, and you mean for the parents in particular? For the parents in particular, right. Yeah, so, so in the parent workshop, what we found among that small sample size, but still among that group, was that many of them didn't know how to help their daughters when they would come home with questions. And so 
imagine you're taking AP calculus or trigonometry or geometry in high school and you come home to a parent for a question and their response is like, I don't know, I never used that before. Uh -huh. and, and they really had no where to send the girl. So it was like, you know, and, and that was kind of it. And so what, what that communicates is mathematics isn't important. I don't use it. You don't really need it to be successful. You know, like, and, and so we had to talk to parents about, here's what you say in those situations. Like, you know, erase everything you've ever said. You say, that's a great question. Hey, uh, there's this homework hotline that HMC has where I know their students can help you with math. Why don't you call? Like, let's sit down and call together. Or, yeah, let's, oh, you know what? Let's go back to the point where you understand and then show me what it, like, walk me through. So we literally had to give them tools, right? Maybe, you know, you couldn't get into a hotline. You didn't have a tutor, but like, okay, ask them to sit down and explain it to you because sometimes in trying to teach you up to the point where they know it'll click, you know, or you'll remember something or the two of you can work it out together. Even if you can't, it shows that you're invested, that you care, right? That this is important. I want you to get this and I'm going to take time for you to get this as opposed to, mm, but I don't know, Ashley, big sibling, you know? And so for us, it was, you know, because those are the moments where girls see that math is or isn't important, right? Um, or when a parent says like, well, what are you going to do with a math major anyway? We would show them like, here are all the different opportunities when your child is interested in math that they could do so that they knew this in the back of their head. And even when their kid would say, oh, what am I going to use this for? It's like, ding, ding, ding. That's your chance to say, here are all the things you can do in math. And so I think our parents really needed ideas for how to support, especially some of our parents who had kids that were first gen, right? It's like, they don't even, they don't have a high school diploma. They don't have a, you know, and so like the thought that you could help your kid with math was overwhelming. And sometimes in not knowing, it's easy to say, well, like, it's just not important you know, instead of like, I don't know, but let me help you to understand. And so really we were kind of helping parents to give them resources that are gonna help them be supportive, even if they didn't know how to. Worst case, I was like, send them to me. Like, tell your kid, I don't know, but there's this professor at Harvey Mudd, here's her email address, right? And, and I can send them to the students, I can give them resource, like I can point them in a direction to keep them engaged and to not, you know, let them kind of drift off. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Well, maybe let me try to follow up with that with a more personal question. I saw one of your not so little ones walk past you in the background a little while ago. Um, I'm wondering, how do you raise Black boys in particular to enjoy the STEM fields? You know, there, there's certainly a lot of push to maybe be a rapper, be a basketball player, you know, be something flamboyant, but there's really not a lot of pressure to be an intellectual. So I'm just wondering, how do you deal with that in your own household? Wow, that's a great question. Um, so for context, my husband and I met in grad school. He was in applied math, I was in statistics. So like when you think about uber nerdy parents, like we are, are there. Um, we don't have a television in our house. Like here's just one room, there's no TV. And so as a family, we, did a, we do a lot of family time together we at a young age would do puzzles and things after meals. And so we really tried to engage our children in a lot of conversation so that they got used to talking to adults and talking about things that adults talk about, right? And so the dinner table, there's a jar, I should run down and get it for you. There's a jar that has topics on strips of paper and it rotates among the boys. And every time we sit down, it's a question and it starts a conversation. And so just getting them used to getting excited about intellectual dialogue, even, <laughs> even uh, at their age. And the questions are like, you know, it's not like, how do we get world peace? It's like today's breakfast question was, what's the hardest thing about being a kid? Uh -huh. And so they were like, oh, them, oh, homework. Ooh, you know, when my brother doesn't want to share the Nintendo Switch with me, you know, like, Okay, you know, so it's not like high level, you know, the, you know, it's not Nobel Prize conversation, but it's a dialogue and it's them learning how to give other people voice, right? Oh, it's so-and-so has the floor, they're sharing, I'm listening, I'm engaging, I'm asking questions. And so those are like... <laughs> 
There you go. <laughs> Thank you, Josiah. Went and got the jar for you all. This is wow. So yeah, here are little questions that are on strips of paper. This is uh, what are the qualities you look for in friends, right? So questions that they can get excited about. Wow. Thank you, son. I know you're not listening to mama's conversation over here. Um, yeah, so this is at our dinner table. Uh, that's one way that we do it. And then, you know, they're also, they're little black boys. And so we're sensitive to um, how they are perceived in the media. I think that's the other reason. We're not just like, boo, TV. It's, you know, when you look at images of black men on television, you know, that's what you see. You see basketball players, you see football players, you see criminals, you know? And so those are images that we want to reinforce. And so we just don't have one. We don't, we don't really want them to see those images. We want to plant seeds of greatness of who they can be um, before we allow the world to kind of show them what the world thinks they are. And so I think that's one way that we try to shelter, shelter them. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Now that, that was a great answer. Um, I, I want to also ask you about this whole thing of, um, you know, how people view African-Americans, let's say even in the STEM fields. Um, and I'm thinking about nowadays, you know, that we live in a, I don't want to say post George Floyd society, but you know, but I think that now there is more of a discussion of what are black lives, you know, what what do they look like? How do how do we view some of them in our society? Um, over Facebook recently, actually over Twitter recently, someone asked me whether there were any black hosts that had YouTube channels, and I gave a shout out to your your colleague Muhammad Omar, you know, to say that he definitely has a channel. There's a lot of things that he's putting out there. But more generally, I'm starting to notice that people are asking more and more this question of, are there ways parents can get their kids interested in STEM using Black voices, either through YouTube channels or through PBS shows? Yeah. I'm just wondering your thoughts more generally on if a parent were to ask that, are there Black voices, are there Black faces out there that their kids can listen to or watch? What, what would you say? You know, so the most prominent voice is Neil deGrasse Tyson. He's not in that, but he's he's tangent. He's tangent. Uh -huh. um, I I I think there are a few prominent black mathematician voices. Uh, while I think Neil is a great example of of someone who has done that well, I think as a mathematics community, we don't really have that voice. I, I think if I think personally, you know. So it's Lydia, why not be that voice? You can be that voice. You know, part of me struggles with how much of myself I want to share. And sometimes I enjoy this retreat to family and, and not having to respond to every Twitter comment and Instagram post, you know? And so um, I kind of go back and forth because I think there's a platform and there's an audience and, you know, and, and, and yet, once you start engaging, you kind of have to keep engaging. And so I think for myself, I really struggle with that. There, there's not a, yeah, you're right. There's Mo, uh -huh. and even still, that's not necessary. It's not that we have consistent content, like, oh, every Tuesday there's a new video, you know? I mean, it's sort of content, but then there's a full-time job that happens on the side that has to take priority, you know? So when school starts up, um, you know, he may not be able to do videos as frequently. And so I think there are these other things that factor into um, visibility. One way that we could overcome that, I think, is if our institutions value that, how do they create, provide resources and time and space for us to do that? So let's say, it's like, yeah, I want to, you know, maybe Harvey Mudd says, okay, you know, we can give you a student who can help, you know, navigate your pages, who can post for you, who can you know, interact with the, in the comment section, then I'm sort of like, oh, so it's not all on me to create, maintain, you know, this, this, this engagement, or maybe I, I can do a video, but I don't know how to edit it, upload it, you know, like, oh, we can do that. We, you know, if you just record something, send it to us raw, we'll fancy it up and we'll do that. And so I think there are ways that institutions could partner with black faculty to kind of get that process going. But right now it's sort of like, Either I do everything or I do nothing, you know. Right, right, yeah, yeah, that makes sense, that makes sense. Uh, let, let me read one question that um, is here in the chat window. Um, this is from, yeah. I hope I pronounced this right, Princess Alate, who asks, um, what is your advice to Black women 
and predominantly white colleges and universities who are the only black people in their classes and do not even have black professors to teach them. Francis, so um, when I got to Rice, <laughs> funny you should mention that, uh, I was the only woman and the only black person in my cohort. So uh, I resonate deeply with with your question. Um, granted, this was graduate school. And so it's, you know, it's a little bit different than being in an undergraduate institution. Um, and you didn't specify undergraduate, but still, yeah, classes were, I was the only, um, and in that environment. For me, I had to build alliances with my male colleagues and be very intentional about it in a way that I don't think they had to be. I think they were accidental group, you know, study group partners. I had to sort of say like, hey, let's all go out to lunch and then study in the math library. I've reserved the space and I, you know, I'm bringing snacks. And so I sort of had to like do work to bring a study group together. It ended up that we worked to together for the, the, the entire time that we were at Rice but I, I sheltered a lot of that work because I needed a group. I needed a study group and no one was like flocking to work with me. I remember we would sit down to do homework and I, I had worked all the problems before we met and then I'd sit down with like a blank sheet of paper and just be like, okay, number one. Oh, I've got an idea. Let me just try blah, 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 right? And so, I needed them to see me as a contributor, as intelligent, as, oh, we need to have Talithia in our study group. And so these are things that I think as a Black woman, I felt like their image of me is not going to be like, oh, she's the smartest one here. Let's work with her. And they were, they're great. Like, yeah, you know, nobody was mean. You know, none of my, um, the guys in my cohort weren't, you know, evil or anything, but it was just sort of like their assumption was not let's invite Talithia over to do homework. And so I had to create that. I had to show that I was intelligent. I had to demonstrate that, oh, I can just solve a math problem on the spot. Never mind. I worked on it for two days straight, you know, and finally got the answer. I'm trying to put it up here. Like this stuff just comes naturally for me. So then by the time a couple weeks passed, when I did have questions, when I didn't really know how to do it, uh, I could ask that in a space where folks assumed that I was really bright and intelligent and not the first time I asked a question, they're like, ooh, now how did you get in? Because you got questions, you know? Um, and so I think I had to be very intentional. Um, you know, and it's interesting in terms of colleagues and, and professors, because professors are sometimes very unintentional. Um, <laughs> oh, this is, this is being recorded, okay. Uh, there was one conversation, it's gonna stay here. Don't copy, don't paste, don't tweet. Uh, the guys would always talk about sports. Like in the time before class starts, you know, you come in, you get situated and the prof would be like, oh, did you guys see the game? They're like, rah, 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 rah. And I would have nothing to say. Cause like, oh, I don't watch baseball. I don't care about baseball. And so one time I came in and they're like, did you guys see the game? I was like, you know, I wasn't feeling well last night. Oh my gosh, I started cramping. And so then I go into all the lovely stuff that comes. And you know, have any of you guys ever, you know, had, you know, sisters that experienced that? Cause I just didn't know. And they were just like, uh, and I was like, exactly. So can we stop talking about sports? Cause I don't want to hear about that either. <laughs> so I got to laugh, but um, there's definitely something to being the only in a space because the default is usually not you, right? It's not your experience. It's not centered around your experience. And even that moment of decentering, like to see how people were very uncomfortable. It's like, that's sometimes how I feel all the time. Like this has not centered no, in no way is my experience a part of this conversation and everyone's oblivious to it, you know? And so when I sort of bring up an experience that everyone's like, oh, this isn't a part, it's like, yep, mm-hmm. So if we're gonna keep chit-chatting, then I'm gonna have some stuff to chit-chat about too. And I'm gonna bring that to the table or like we can talk about stats. Right, okay, yeah, yeah, th thanks for, for that. I, um, let, let me ask you kind of the, the flip side to that. So, um, so you're talking about when you were a student working with other students. Now that you're a faculty member mm. and you see students going through this, yeah. 
do you, how, how do you deal with that? What, what do you tell the students? What kind of advice do you give them now that you see them going through some of the things that you went through? It's tough. I've had black women students at Harvey Mudd who have had that same experience, who, um, who were not as like outgoing, you know, olive branch come together. It was just kind of like, I made a suggestion, it got cut down. Some guy said it five minutes later and then we did it, you know? And so those are never good places to be. And it, it unfortunately is a life lesson. I mean, the conversation usually starts with like, okay, let's look at this. Let's, let's recognize that it was wrong and that it didn't feel good. And let's just sit in that for a minute because it's not like, a, all right, tell me who they are and I'm gonna, you know, punish them because that doesn't, that doesn't help her group dynamic. Um, but sometimes just creating that space to sit and talk about strategies. For me, um, one of the things that I tried to help her do was to be vocal in that moment, right? To sort of be the one to say, hey, guys, let's pause. I said that five minutes ago and here's what you said. And now you're going along with so-and-so. Like that felt really weird to me. And so I'm curious to hear why we didn't go with it when I said, right? Just sort of like, how do you put it back on the other people so that they can recognize in that moment that they did something that affected you? Because often we internalize it like, oh, they didn't hear me. But really you're saying, I just want you to know that you didn't hear me. And was that your intention? Because if it was, like it didn't feel good that now we're doing my suggestion and we're attributing it to someone else. And so how do you, in that frustration, give voice to what you're feeling so that someone else has to respond to the discomfort, right? Like, how do you put it on someone else to say like, oh, tell me what you mean when you said that. Cause you know, is that what I thought you meant? And then it's kind of like, now they're on the defensive, like, oh, oh, you know, oh, oh, we're sorry. We're sorry. Yeah. Like, I want to hear you apologize. I want to hear everybody say you're sorry. Cause I made a suggestion and you, you cut it off and you ignored it. And so even, even that instance helps people become more aware, not that they necessarily change behavior and everything's great, but in that moment, I think it helps them become aware of your feelings and how they were ignored in the moment. Right. Uh, there's no magic bullet to solving that. Uh, I think I experienced it even as a faculty member today, so. Right, I understand, yeah. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna try to ask a couple more questions here, so now we're running a little bit late. Yeah, this is from the Q&A window. This is from Lucy Rycroft-Smith, who says, you mentioned being a parent and bringing your whole self to work. How can we support identities in mathematics that are so much more than just the socially awkward lone white male genius that most people picture? Yeah, I mean, um, that's what I try to do. Yeah, exactly. I mean, um, I think in the math department, uh, so, you know, I think we are, fortunate to have a, a very diverse department at, at Harvey Mudd uh, in terms of, you know, trying to showcase talent in different, you know, in different people, black people, white people, brown people, Asian people, um, and women. But um, I think one way that we normalize it is by making, so let's just say in the classroom, um, I try to create problems that have very intentionally diverse names. Um, so maybe, you know, Muhammad and Jamal are names that I use in an example. And I want to let my students think about that. Like, oh, instead of like Adam and, and Bill and Susie, nothing wrong with those. Hey, Adam, Bill and Susie, if you're watching. But often we use very generic names, which convey white images when we imagine them. And so I try to help my students by giving them examples that are very diverse, of names that are diverse, of situations that are diverse, right? Every example doesn't need to be cookie cutter. Um, how do I give an example that might relate to uh, a person of color in their community that also teaches the mathematics? And so in this way, I'm, I'm normalizing what life is like for that person in a math problem example. Uh, because you don't always have that representation in the faculty and even among the students. And so one way that we infuse it is by being intentional. We could also do, you know, colloquium, right? Like a prime, for example, right? How do we invite those folks to our campus? If they're not there, have them come and give a talk, right? And um, 
make it prominent, right? If this is the only black man in math in the state of Massachusetts, then maybe the president should introduce him. And maybe there's a dinner, like maybe it's a big deal that we've got this person here instead of just for the math department. And so ways that you can help bring attention, not just to math majors, but you know, to an institution, maybe this could be a diversity speaker who comes and talks about their work, not just to a small department, but to an entire institution. I think those are ways to help normalize black excellence in math and in other subjects as well, um, to try to elevate that image for your students. Yeah. Oh, that, that does sound great. Um, let's, see. Let, let's maybe try to do one last question. I know that we're, we're way over, but I do want to try to get to one more. So we'll call this the last one. Catherine Knitzo asks, how did you find your voice speaking out about reaffirming people of color and women of color in STEM? As in go from noticing the hidden black woman figures in math to talking about it in a public way so that a lot of people listen. Oh, Catherine, great question. Um, how did I find my voice? I think it was, I think it grew from sharing my personal story. Uh, so if you were to look back at talks that I would give five, six, seven years ago, they were often about my journey. So kind of the first half of like, oh, I was in, you know, here's me in middle school, here's me in high school. I worked as a cashier, you know, I wasn't doing summer research programs. I was mentored by these women of color. And so it grew from just sort of sharing this story. And then I think I realized that that this story is unique, right? I think as an undergraduate, I thought like, oh, most departments must have black women on the faculty. Spelman has six. And it wasn't until I got to Rice that I realized it was a, that was abnormal, right? And so as I'm matriculating, I'm seeing that, you know, this, this, supportive, inclusive four years of undergraduate that I had with all these black women where I just focused on the math. I just enjoyed the math. This is not the experience for most women of color. And, and so then it became, oh, how can I get that message out? And how can I also help, you know, the white men who are leading math departments to be thoughtful about that, right? And so when they come and say, well, Talithia, what do we do? How do we help our students become like you? We're not at a Faulkner. Uh -huh. um, and so then I had to think, well, you know, you don't have to be like, here are some tools. And so, and so to answer your question, Catherine, I think it just sort of built over time. There wasn't a moment where it was like, ah, I have the power now. It was really kind of seeing what folks needed in the moment, what departments needed, what people were looking for, thinking about my experience and the components of it that helped me stay in math and you know kept me kept me grounded in math and ways that other departments might do that. At a Faulkner's effect on me had little to do with the fact that she was black or a woman. I mean like so she could have had a similar effect had she been a white man who was like you can do it nurturing here's a program here's a person you know I mean and so while I you know, I thought, I'm, you know, I'm excited. I was happy that she was also a black woman. That wasn't the part of her that helped me know that I could do it. And in fact, you might have black women at universities who, who aren't interested in like mentoring, you know, and that's okay too. And so uh, that's why I sort of shared, like these are the parts of Dr. Faulkner that stick with me and her identity as a black woman is a small part of that. Like, yes, no, sure, I saw her and I thought she looks like my grandmother. But beyond that, you know, it was it was the way that she influenced me. And I think I've tried to take that influence and then distill it to folks so that they can do it uh, for the people around them, regardless of their race, regardless of, of their gender. And so I think this voice came over time as I started putting those pieces together and realizing that, oh, this might actually help someone else you know, in this situation, be an effective mentor to students of color. Right, right, yeah. That's a great question, thank you. Yeah, but no, with, with that, I, I personally do thank you a lot. I, I really enjoyed the fact that you did help us with um, Edda Faulkner's mindsets and the different thoughts here on what, what we can all do. So, yeah, so again, thank you very much for your time, for a wonderful presentation and for, for a great conversation here. Yes, bye everyone, thank you so much. Yeah, bye everyone.